Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Welcome back, everybody. Going to talk about something today that uh, we never really dug into this. We love our our pets. Specifically, you got a dog. It's like a member of your family. And she's somebody who has been instrumental, pioneer in New Mexico, setting up a canine physical rehab center. She's kind of the go-to for canine rehab, animals in general. Today, we're going to look at the growth of a puppy. What happens in the stages all along the way? And yeah, you know, it's always been a phrase with, uh, with our children. Oh, they grow up so fast. They grow up so fast. Puppies really do grow up fast. It's amazing. A year later, you know, we're almost out of the puppy stage. We're going to look at that today with uh, Dr. Laura Haiti, who joins us on the program. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Steve. I get to talk about one of my favorite topics. I've got three seven-month-old puppies in my household. Two are Chihuahua crosses, and one is a healer cross. And it's a very exciting time. I always... Uh, I, it's like getting that new baby, being that expectant mom or dad. And whether you get them from a breeder or whether you get them from a rescue group, you want to know some basic facts of what's going on between birth and the time you pick them up, maybe say about eight weeks of age. Uh, or what type of nutrition did they get? Were, were they bottle fed versus were they nursed by um, a mom at the breeder's house? Were they put on different types of surfaces or were they kept in a cage? Because that can affect uh, their ability to stand and move correctly. You don't use it, you lose it, and they've got to wow. be able to, to stand up or they become swimmer puppies. And the other thing is, is what type of play did they get? You know, some breeders will buy those large kitty pools and they have puppy pads in there and the dogs get a, get a walk on different surfaces. So those are... That first uh, set of eight weeks, those are are highly, highly developmental times for the puppy. Mm. Uh, but you you said you have three puppies in your home. Are you fostering, or these are all yours? These are all mine. I tend to rescue dogs. Uh, I have a whole network of people out there, whether it be my clients throughout the years, or whether it be other veterinarians. Um, and I have local taps with the rescue groups as well as uh, animal welfare and animal control. So I've I've adopted from all stages in life, and uh, it's it's very interesting to me how sometimes you get caught in the problem with a growth uh, deformity, and uh, what what we can do along the lines to make those people on the front lines of rescue and those breeders. Uh, how we can catch these things early and, and help solve the problems. So take us through the, the stages of a growing puppy. So we, we, you know, we have the beginning. I, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, uh, eight weeks or uh, a little bit more where they're usually with their mom. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then what happens past that? Typically, most breeders will adopt them out after the eight-week stage, and we have to remember, too, that the eight-week to 12-week stage in a puppy is the socialization period, so they need to be socialized at this time with different types of people and different types of animals, because behavior will also um, help dictate uh, their growth as well. This may be the time where they go to that first veterinary visit. And so it's a very exciting time for me because I get to not only check out their eyes, their teeth, their ears, their heart, but I also get to feel the joints for the first time. And uh, mm. there's there's some joints that are supposed to feel loosey-goosey at, at eight weeks. And there's some joints that you shouldn't hear any popping or feel anything changes. Uh, for example, when you go to rotate the the hip and you know, that's one of the first things that we check in these puppies um they may have already had a vaccine uh prior to coming for the exam how are we going to get them set up on that every three to four week schedule uh as they as they grow so that we can check them out and then were they given any parasite medication um were they has someone looked at a fecal sample because parasites can suck nutrients out and they may have gotten parasites from their mom particularly in a rescue situation sure. and you don't know that so we want to we want to check those things out and that's what we discuss at that first visit yeah you just brought back a memory uh of two years ago i already had a kitten 
And then I adopted another one right after that, you know, a couple of months after. Right. And the second kitten had parasites mm -hmm. and um, they weren't able to get rid of them right away. So it was right. kind of an extended period of time. So mm -hmm. I had to keep, uh, I had to keep the, the two kittens segregated. Um, right. But yeah, parasites can be uh, a bit challenging, you know, like you say, depending where they're coming from. Mine was a foster, both of them were. Um, but, it, you know, you could have the cleanest household ever and get parasites in your pet. You know, right? Uh, right. Yeah, exactly. And we like to talk about at this stage, most of these little guys should be being fed, particularly in that eight to 16 week period, three times a day. And we discuss what brand of food that they're feeding. Uh, definitely some people are, are very excited about feeding raw diets. And these guys are really, really young. So their susceptibility to get parasites like uh, salmonella or other things is higher. Also, when we look at these diets, we want to look at has that diet been tested for the proper calcium to phosphorus ratio? And it seems, wow, you know, you feed them bones or you feed them organs or whatnot, but there's a very precise 1.6 to 1 ratio uh, and that changes, That's that goes a little bit higher when they're um, puppies. And we have to make sure things like vitamin D are also within check for these guys. Socialization, obviously key. What should you be doing in those early stages? Because I feel that you are, you're molding your, your, your puppy or your pet, you know, for you and your family and your lifestyle uh it's i know in my dog he just he got he has a rhythm and the, and it's it's part of you know my world <laughs> and it, it's kind of remarkable when you see how they adapt to different situations but what should we be doing during the uh socialization stage so typically a lot of people ask about walking them walking them on public uh walk lanes or going to dog parks and whatnot. And I really caution until they've had that second or third vaccine to keep them away from those areas. That being said, that doesn't mean you can't put your pup in the stroller and take them out for a walk. And when you're in an area where you know it's safe to let them get out on a little leash in a harness and do a little bit of walking. But as you get into those higher air traffic areas, uh, not everyone in New Mexico cleans up the stool or whatnot after after their pets on a walk. So um, I always like to have that stroller option to get them back in there. Uh, if I go into uh, business, lots of businesses are pet friendly now. Um, I still have a little carrier for them uh, so that they're not picking up something within the, the store, but they're yet they're still getting to meet people and see new circumstances and right in the car. So uh, initially I said they grow up fast. Puppies mm -hmm. really do. Uh, what happens when we get to like the, let's call it the six month stage. And mm -hmm. when does a puppy just become what we would consider an adult? Typically they become an adult depending on the size of the dog, usually about a, a year of age. So when they're going through that age uh, where we give maybe that last set of vaccines around 16 weeks, say they get their the rabies tag, and I always call it their temporary driver's license here in New Mexico. And we may not see them back for their spay or neuter. That's a key growth um, area. So what happens is at the end of the long bones, there's softer cartilage so that it can expand and grow. And what can happen in these guys, particularly, uh, I'll give two examples, one in larger breed dogs like the Labrador Retrievers or the Rottweilers, German Shepherds, Great Deans, is that if these bones are growing way too fast and that cartilage at the end of those bones outgrows that blood supply, it can basically, that little flap of cartilage can now rub and it can become a flap and that flap can become dry, hence the name osteochondrosis desiccans, dry desiccans. And that uh, little fluid, joint fluid can sneak in underneath and then you start to get inflammation. With inflammation, that flap may break off. And so then it's like having that uh, piece of gravel in your shoe and dogs are weight bearing on their front legs mm. and you can start to have problems. Or say that uh, 
you have the, on your arm, you have the radius kind of in the front and the ulna that goes back, it's a little bit longer, but if that ulna is growing way too fast, you can have so, a little piece that ulna can break off when it has uneven uh, ride against where, as the humerus and the radius come together uh, all together within that joint. And so it, again, you can have another little joint mouse and, and that can make it difficult what we worry about in the little guys, uh, so having chihuahuas, so short, crooked legs, also think about basset hounds and corgis and little shih tzus and yorkies. What can happen with those guys if their bones are growing out of proportion is they can get what's called valgus deformity in their wrist or varus deformity. And so essentially, if you don't correct that, they're going to get arthritis later on. And in some of those breeds, what they'll actually do is because the ulna is growing way too fast, they'll cut a piece of the ulna out and fill it in with say a piece of fat or a graft, and then it'll slow down that growth so that you can have correct angulation uh, through the wrist and up into the elbow. Well, let's talk about nutrition and food. Mm -hmm. Very impactful, important along the way, you know, puppy food transition over adult, adult food. Um, what are your thoughts there? So my transition stage for these guys is, is I typically uh, wean them from a, a puppy food that has lots of protein, increased calories, a different ratio of your calcium to phosphorus and vitamin D. I'll switch them, wean them over to an adult food about 10 months of age. And people will say, that's not what the back of the dog food brand says. But typically at this time, uh, except for we talked about uh, that tibia, the shin bone, that's the last growth plate to close. That closes at 14 months and bigger dogs. A lot of their height has already been set by age 10 months. And so I'll transition them over at that time. We actually had a pit bull puppy come in. Um, it was a little late on its vaccines, right around um, four months for that first vaccine. And the legs were already uh, crooked, bowing out. And you ask the owner how much they're feeding per day, and they're just feeding an excessive amount of food, like four cups a day. And so we're trying to transition them to twice a day feeding at, at about that 16 month period. Well, how do you know how much to feed your dog? Even, even if it's, you know, you have an adult dog, let's say five years old, weighs 25 pounds, you know, not a tiny one, not a big one. How do you know how much your dry food that you're, you should be feeding them? Side note, how do you know it should be dry food? <laughs> I never uh, exactly. So uh, dry versus canned food, they're going to have different calorie counts. And typically what I tell people is uh, the average, say, amount of calories in a quality dry dog food is about 389 calories per cup. So closer on up to up to 400 calories per cup. And if you multiply, you get the uh take their body weight, say it's 15, 50 pounds, right? And uh, you divide it and you're trying to get into kilograms. So you divide that by half, say about 20 by uh, kilograms multiplied by two uh, is uh, 50. And then you do it to a certain uh, exponential formula. There's a neat little formula out there. There's some ones for growing, one for adult and whatnot then you can, uh, your vet or the vet tech can help you calculate how many calories that your dogs need. And there's actually uh, food calculators online for calories, which dogs need. And then you can decide how much is that. So in our household, typically they're fed a high quality food. And what people will say is, uh, well, I feel like I'm feeding a high quality food. And what I tell people to do is go home and um, I'll show you a picture about how much stool my dog produces a day and you show me a picture about how much stool your dog produces a day and uh and you'll find with the higher quality foods there's going to be less stool less waste because the body's processing it more and so we'll talk about what happens in a 50 pound dog is in our household once they reach adulthood they'll eat uh two-thirds to one cup twice a day plus snacks so uh, I allow a certain amount of calories per day for snacks. Mm. My dog poops less than yours. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> sounds, unless, of course, you know, maybe they're on a higher fiber diet uh, due to some health issues and whatnot. So that's a good, good kind of balance act to, to tail. Interesting. 
So yeah. would you would you say so I, I wrestle with this. My my dog is on dry food mm -hmm. and I don't overfeed him. I'm very careful about that. Um but basically two cups a day. Mm -hmm. You know, I give him one in the morning, one in the late afternoon, um, an occasional treat here and there. But there's a lot of times where I'll have leftover chicken. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, should I just give him a little bit of chicken, you know, add it on top of his uh his dry food. Uh, is is that a good idea to introduce that, that type of stuff if they've always been on dry food? Some people, you know, I think it's fine. We do it at our house as a topper, yeah. um, just as a little treat. You know, we figured out how many calories they need if it makes them finish their bowl and it's easier to, to clean up versus a free fed dog. So they've done a study where puppies, uh, they did a study with Labradors. It's a, it's a prenatal study actually. And they fed dogs ad litem. So they left out food all day, uh, for them versus meal fed dogs that were vet, fed a specific amount of dogs and, uh, of food at a time. Basically what they found was they followed these dogs throughout their li their lifetime. And the dogs who were fed a, a measured out portion lived two years longer the dogs wow. that weren't had more problems, say, with their hips, with their joints later on in life. Wow. And what a, yeah, that's an incredible two years with extra with your pet. That That's a really long time. And I always emphasize to people that at that spay neuter time, my mentor always told me, he goes, you're going to have the dog for the day, sometimes even overnight. You're going to be sedating that animal. You're going to have them under anesthesia. So why don't you palpate those joints really well and just double check to see if there's any clicking that that you notice while you're palpating. That way you can feel a lot of normal dogs and you'll be able to understand even in the exam room when you feel an, uh, an abnormal dog. The dog may not always cry out in pain if they have a growth deformity. And that's a good time too because you can call the owner and get permission to do x-rays under anesthesia so that you can maybe catch some of these, um, the bone lesions in these pets and the joint lesions early on. So that's a very precise thing. Sometimes we get a little nervous because if wow. they don't come back to us for that spay neuter time, hey, when are we gonna feel those joints one last time? Because a lot of the growth problems happen between five and eight months of age. So we have a very small window to correct them. Plus, if we need to refer them to a surgeon, um, there may be a delay in referring them. So we want to keep up with that and, and catch these as soon as possible. Wow. So, so interesting. You're saying that if you have an animal under, under anesthesia, mm -hmm. anesthesia, and uh, while you have them, it's like, let's check their joints, you know, <laughs> so they don't give any pushback and... <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of creepy to me, but just, you know, just moving things around, you can actually hear clicks and pops, um, right. even, even when they're sedated. Even when they're, even when they're sedated, wow. it, even when they're sedated, the nice thing is you still will get a little bit of that, a little bit of that pain response. Granted in your sedation, you have some pain medication on board, but then you kind of get to see, like we, we've talked about where their eye position is, where their mouth position is. And it's a good way to practice when um, when you have a little bit more time and you're not being rushed uh, to get a feel of what normal is and what abnormal is. So interesting, the stuff we're learning here today. Um, let's let's assume that you know our puppy is now a year old. Um, what kind of things, maybe even a little bit older? What kind of things should we we be doing to support them? Support their their yeah, physical growth, but also mental mental growth. So what I've already recommended, usually uh, when they've come through for their initial vaccine series, I, 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 you know, I've told them, if you want to get your pup into a basic obedience class, go ahead and, and get them into a basic obedience class now. And there's some really great trainers out there. And uh, my, my pets, uh, some of my rescues, I didn't get them until they were older. And so, but we still went to that puppy obedience class and it didn't matter if I had a little tiny chihuahua among all these huge, wily golden retrievers, Doberman pinchers, pit bulls, they had to do the same tricks. And what happens I find is right about that eight month to a year age, 
we get this kind of, I call it a brain fart because they're hitting their adolescence and teenage years. And so then we'll go ahead and repeat and say, maybe they need to go to that second level obedience class or do I need to go to start taking them if I'm, I want to do sports with them, right? I, mm. I want them to do agility uh, coursework where they're running, they're jumping, they're going through tunnels and dog walks. Uh, maybe I want to get them into a foundation class if they've done well with their obedience class. And this is the time you, where you really need to network. Your veterinarian obviously will know what, who, are, who are the better agility trainers in town or the obedience trainers. Uh, they can help guide you uh, in that. And then uh, say you wanted to do something, say you're like, oh, I don't know about that high impact stuff. I want to start doing scent work with my dogs. And I have one right now, a little Corgi. She's just knocking the pants off. She's uh, she's a high end detective scent dog. So that's wow. pretty, pretty good with it. Uh, the That one year time uh, frame of time, I also want to caution people for, things that maybe maybe they haven't caught. Uh, sometimes a trainer and a that's around dogs all day can they're they've got good eyes and everything. They can say, hey, you might want to go to a vet for for what's going on and and uh, whatnot. So coming back full circle, basically um there's there's stories abound, but one story that sticks with me and and maybe you like to be on the cutting edge of things, Steve, is that this is about 15 plus years ago. A uh, lab came to me at 18 months of age, uh, pain in the elbows. Uh, x rays showed uh, extensive arthritis. The x rays looked like the dog was like over 10 years of age and it's only 18 months old. Took the, the dog, was there that day, showed my mentor, and he goes, Well, you know, what we can do is we can go in arthroscopically with a camera. And you would never think, Hey, we can go. We can do this, but went in, cleaned out that joint and all those joint flaps the best that he could. And he actually harvested uh, uh, stem cells from the abdomen, or you can do it from the bone marrow, um, and then injected them into the joint uh, when they had enough of the total number of cells, plus some of the platelet-rich plasma, which has the growth factors that direct those stem cells to maybe become that nice, smooth hyaline cartilage. And uh, she had that. And they also banked the cells so she could have several injections throughout her lifetime. She lived to 15 years of age. Wow. Huh. You know, you hear little pieces of information about stem cell research and all of that, but never in, I've never heard of it in, in animals like this to support them. Wow. Amazing. Uh, it, you're doing great work. Laura, it's so fantastic just hearing about this and just your your insight and foresight on on our animals. Final question here. We talk about obedience training. Is it ever too late? No, it's never too late. And that's okay. the neat part about it. You can teach a dog, an old dog, new tricks. And that's for sure. I didn't get my deaf, almost blind Aussie uh, I was unable to get him into obedience. Uh, he finally went at 15 months of age. He barked the entire first class. I asked the trainer, please don't tell anyone here I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he, you know, he, he got most improved by the end of the class. And uh, wow. typically I get to work with some, the neat part is I get to work with maybe some older dogs where they're a little nervous about bringing them to class with a lot of dogs all at one time. You know, and I get to work with them nice and slow. And dogs are so, uh, they, they're just so adept at learning, you know, and they want to please you. And uh, yeah. you can teach them new tricks and new exercises all the time. Sure. Especially if they're food driven. You can, yeah. I think, get anything done <laughs> if, if if the food is a motivator. Uh, I, I know you don't have a, a website, Laura, but if somebody has a question about any of this, they want to reach out. Can they email you? Yeah, email is actually one of the best ways to get a hold of me. That way, if you have x-rays or you have blood work or other questions, it's k9profnm at gmail.com, uh, or you can shoot me a text, 505-280-5962. I try to respond when I, uh, the best I can, but I'm usually down and out playing with the animals and, and doing exams. So I uh, really enjoyed the the podcast series and I hope to do more someday. Oh, well, I appreciate 
everything uh, that you've offered to us. And uh, you've done wonderful things in New Mexico. Now we're spreading the wor word around the world, literally. Uh, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much uh, for, for everything, Laura. Really, really amazing. Okay. I learned so much. There you go. Have fun with your pups and your kitties, Steve. Yep. Thank you. I, everybody else the same. It's a um, little, little uh, <laughs> bundles of fur and love. Um, we'll talk soon, okay? All righty. Take care, Steve. Bye. We'll be right back. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go, and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house. And there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.